It's uh, terrific to see such a, a great crowd here and, um, well, all I can say is we made it. This has uh, been a fantastic journey uh, since New Zealand, which was an amazing meeting, but uh, thanks to a terrific local organising committee um, here in Brisbane, uh, we've made it and we have a conference and a, certainly a great week ahead. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome you to Brisbane, the University of Queensland, and extend to you a very special welcome from the Executive Director, Bethany Walder, and the Chair, Jim Hallett, of the Society for Ecological Restoration um, in Washington. Um, as I said last week, of all of the chapters that SER has around the world, SERA, representing the 15 countries of this region, they said, you guys rock. So I guess that's American for that we're doing pretty well. And uh, you'll see some of those things just at the end of this, uh, this uh, opening. We're going to hear more thanks at the end of the week, but I just wanted to acknowledge the fabulous work that's being put into this conference by a number of key people. Um, they're sitting in the front row here, which is Valerie Hagar and Peter Erskine, who have done extraordinary amount of heavy lifting on this. Um, of course, Katie Tompkins and the Loud team, who are the professional conference organisers, are simply world class. And uh, I must say, I've never dealt with such a professional group. So good on Brisbane, good on you guys. Also, the team from the Australian Research uh, Council Centre for Mindsight Restoration, which includes uh, Renee Young and um, Hayley Degu and uh, Vanessa MacDonald, who can't be here, who have been really uh, helping bookend um, the organisational side. So a terrific team, and I think um, what we've brought together is a really fabulous meeting that I'm looking forward to. The only problem is we have fabulous concurrent sessions, but many, many clashes, of course. So this is a really important meeting for SERA, somewhat of a watershed meeting. We have 303 delegates, which is uh, fabulous, and uh, 14 countries and 26 nationalities represented. So we're actually broadening out into the region. Um, altogether, we also have representatives of 33 uh, non-government organisations. These are the, the coalface of restoration in this country and we have a whole range of people from various government and regulatory bodies. So welcome to you all, and please um, connect. And uh, I think this is the conference of the practitioner and working on restoration on ground. This is also our first conference where we have worked very hard to make it family friendly. So we've been working with uh, mums and dads who have wanted to come along but don't have adequate childcare. And so um, we're hoping to use this now as a model for all of our international meetings, both here and SER. So good on SERA for trying the first family-friendly conference, because it's certainly the way of the future, and fits in with the theme of very much the next generation of restoration ecologists that we need to now uh, nurture in the journey forward. This is also a conference where we've worked very hard to minimise and have almost a waste-free conference. So you would have got your notification, pick up your plastic bottle off the aeroplane if you flew here, or bring your own little keep cup um, for water, and there will be water refilling stations and uh, there around the place. Um, and um, overall, we would welcome any feedback on ways to improve uh, the sustainability of these conferences going forward. Now, on the on the topic of conferences, um, we do have the next conference, which is planned for 2020. It has been decided, but it's top secret until the closing ceremony on Thursday. So you'll have to come to that. And I must say, it's a very exciting venue, and it's an extraordinarily exciting and contemporary theme that we have, but you'll have to wait till then. Just a few little extra announcements that are quite important. This afternoon is the annual general meeting of SERA. Um, we're at the St Lucia Cafe, that's about 500 metres from here, and uh, there, there's a group of us that will be heading towards there, and uh, just look for people with the green 
tops on. So, in fact, all the green top people that you see around the place are the volunteers. Thank you all for your terrific effort. And they're the people that actually know more about this conference than I do. So please ask them for that advice. Thursday night is a very special um, conference dinner. It's not just the regular dinner, but it's also our awards ceremony. And I encourage you to think about coming along to that. There, it has been an overwhelmingly successful second round of our awards. Uh, we had the first ones in the, at the New Zealand meeting, but we had an astonishing 15 finalists in the categories, and all of them were simply outstanding. And of course, they were uh, from an international pool of applications. Uh, so think about uh, coming along if you haven't, of course. Um, got your ticket. There are still some tickets available, but today I think uh, Katie's indicated is the, the closing off time. Now just um, uh, by way of encouraging the conference to reach out to a broader group, please do tweet during the conference all positive things. Um, I have to admit that I have just got a tweet account. So yeah, I know. Donald Trump and me now share one thing in common. <laughs> I have more hair than him. Um, but please do tweet. It does matter, and it's certainly a way that we reach out to our international constituency. Um, in terms of um, some of the uh, other activities that we've got, a morning and afternoon teas are in and around the poster area. Lunch is in the marquee in the amphitheatre, the natural amphitheatre area. Just follow uh, the people in the green shirts or just follow the crowd as we head towards those lunch uh, venues. Um, any special announcements for delegates will be made during the plenary and there's also a notice board that has been set up so you can certainly catch up with any of the latest information that is in and around that area. Now before we go to a, a very special and important part of our meetings, which is the Welcome to Country, I have one little task to do, which is um, through the great efforts of Team MacDonald and the drafting team, you will all be aware of the uh, national standards for the practice of ecological restoration, which, were, which was launched in Parliament House Canberra by the Prime Minister's delegate, the Prime Minister back then, not the current one. Um, and um, that was launched uh, in November last year. And as a result of the success of that document, we've now produced a mums and dads copy. It's called the explainer and um, when we didn't put them in your satchels, we would prefer that you ask for a copy so that we don't waste paper. But this is an explainer that is a really easy and accessible way of, of understanding the standards, the sort of thing that you take along that you might use in a funding application um, for local governments, community groups and so on. So thanks to Teen and the drafting team and Vicky Kramer who uh, drafted the um, uh, common usage language. So it's taken the standards and made it in a more accessible form and so we're very pleased to launch that at this morning's uh, opening ceremony. So please uh, take them. We welcome feedback and uh, we look forward to uh, coming out with subsequent editions with, with more improvements. So uh, at this juncture, it now gives me great pleasure to invite um, uh, Joseph Ruska. Joseph um, is uh, a descendant of the Yugara and Turbal people of the Brisbane, Logan, Ipswich regions and the Nunakal and Nugi people of Stradbroke and Norton Islands and the Kumumbiri people of the Gold Coast area. And of course, indigenous people on the East Coast and particularly in Queensland were some of the first to have contact. And so it's very symbolic that we have a welcome to country from uh, Joseph. And he comes from, of course, a family that are well known to many of you as the um, Nunukal Yugara dancing trip that are performed internationally around the world. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Joseph to give us our welcome to country. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joseph Ruska, uh, son of Shannon Ruska. I am here to give you a welcome to country. I am a um, proud descendant of the Yagara people of this area, also the Turubu people. 
the Yagara country stretched from the mouth of the Brisbane River, south to the Logan River and out to the Great Dividing Range to the foothills of Warwick and Toowoomba and back out to the Caboolture River. Um, there are over 350 different countries, uh, tribal groups around Australia and over 150 dialects between each tribe. If we, were, if we wanted to pass into another tribal group's area, we would have what was called a message stick. And what a message stick was, was a piece of wood with a bit of carving or markings on it that represented that family group and that would be passed over by the messenger. If you didn't have this, if you didn't have this message stick on you, uh, the tribal members of that area would spear you dead on the spot or, yeah, there would be other penalties with that. So on behalf, of the, on behalf of the Yagra people of this country, my father's country, my grandfather's country, I'd like to say yura yura nambali, yanara ganaripa jara, nanya birili, nanya bayami, nanya maramakara, nanya. You are all welcome on my grandfather's land and may God and our ancestors guide you in peace through this area. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Joseph, and um, um, sage words, um, and and great to to hear the traditional languages. I uh, had the um, pleasure uh, just recently to listen to one of our uh, astonishing uh, local Noongars in Perth, and she spoke very eloquently about the fact that when she was a child, her language had become just a whisper, and uh, but uh, we're now teaching it in Indigenous schools and. Uh, uh, I look forward to hearing a lot more Indigenous language around Australia. Well, everyone, that's the end of the formal opening, and um, uh, we're running now just slightly ahead of schedule, but we've actually got a full house here. So I propose that we move straight into our first opening plenary. And um, as you will see from your program, it's uh, Jackie Moore. Now, I first heard Jackie and met her in Brazil last year at the SERA conference in uh, Iguazu. And uh, Jackie just impressed me with her fresh take on restoration. And um, we thought, what a great person to have along uh, at this conference. She's from the Institute on Ecosystems at the College of Business, University of Montana. And Jackie has a very auspicious title. She's the Poe Family Distinguished Faculty Member and Fellow, Institute on Ecosystems at the University of Montana. So it's quite a mouthful, but she certainly comes with great credentials. She received a PhD in marketing, so you get a hint that we're going to get quite a different twist on the way we think and operate within the restoration space. And uh, she did that at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is quite a centre of prairie restoration in that part of the states. And she was an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder prior to joining um, her group at the University of Montana. So it gives me enormous pleasure and great pride to welcome Jackie Moore to the podium for her presentation um, on the values in restoration. Thank you very much, Jackie. Good morning. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have my first experience in this wonderful country. I actually flew over from New Zealand where I'm on sabbatical for three months with my partner Michael. Um, we've just come back from the Whitsunday Islands where we flew on Saturday and I've left my family up there. My 22-year-old daughter is traveling with us for a month. And uh, we did enjoy the snorkeling and the scuba diving, despite the worries that are going on up there. And our belief is we live in an area where there are grizzly bears. And we, do, we still go out hiking all the time. And it's just being in nature. Um, our guides on our sailboat assured us that she had only seen white-tipped reef sharks and that this was a very rare thing. So we, we took to the water somewhat trepidatiously, but we enjoyed it nonetheless. So thank you for the very warm welcome to be here. And it is quite unusual for a marketing professor to have 
turned into uh, an ecologist, and most people associate marketing with selling more people more stuff that they really don't need, which leads to further degradation of the landscape. But when I talk about marketing, marketing is really about understanding people's motivations that underlie their behavior. And that can be put to good uses or bad uses. And so I've always been interested in what motivates people to adopt innovations. And my team at the University of Montana, uh, we have some world-class ecologists there, invited me to join their team because they felt like having a different perspective from outside the discipline would enrich the team. So today I'll be speaking about uh, the research that we've done, and I am clicking my little remote here, making sure the battery is on. There we go. I think it was not on. Did you have a PowerPoint that was loaded up? I did have a PowerPoint that was loaded up. <laughs> Excuse me while we get that up here. It's under J. Moore. There I am right there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for your help. Okay. Can I talk to you? Yeah, very good. <coughs> Okay, so um, my research sits at the area right now with my interdisciplinary research team at the intersection of the natural world and business. And I have about three different topics and projects going on in this area, and today I'll be speaking about one of them. Uh, Karen Nelson, who's been a longtime member of the Society of Ecological Restoration in the United States, is on my research team, and she's the one who introduced me to SCR, and I'm really grateful for that introduction because it's opened up a new lens for me on uh, an area that I'm really passionate about, which is the natural world and bringing my research to that area. Now, my specific area of expertise is in how to overcome barriers to diffusion of new innovations. And I typically have studied emerging technologies, such as electric vehicles in the United States, information hardware and software, um, artificial intelligence, right now I'm really hot on blockchain, and so applying some of what I know about adoption and diffusion of these emerging technologies is highly relevant to ecological restoration, and I'll get into that for a minute, uh, in a minute. I've been working with my team now for five years, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of context on the site that we study. Um, for the past five years, this is a photo of the uh, Upper Clark Fork River, which is about 30 miles east of Missoula. This is the Milltown Dam, which was recently removed. It is one of the largest Superfund cleanup sites and dam removal sites in the United States. Um, so I thought I'd give you a little context on this. Um, there are over 100 years of contamination resulting from the copper mining, which is upstream in Butte, Montana. Some of you may have heard of the Berkeley Pit, which is one of the most polluted uh, areas in the United States. And the company, ARCO, provided, uh, which is now BP, BP brought ARCO, provided $400 million for remediation and restoration on the river. And so we're removing toxic mining waste, including heavy metals, and we are also restoring the riparian vegetation, the fish populations, and a functioning floodplain. And a project of this scope is obviously very complex, and we have multiple state agencies involved, multiple NGOs, lots of community groups, lots of businesses, and private landowners are uh, legally required to allow remediation on their lands, but their participation in the restoration process is voluntary. So this gives a little bit of context, and what we've done is we have collected data from all the NGOs, landowners, businesses, and state agencies who are involved in this project. And my research on this project has shown that innovation in ecological restoration, and more specifically, in this area of um, habitat restoration, it shows that the willingness to adopt innovation is very, very similar as in the other domains that I've studied. So as I go through this talk today, what I would like to do is give you a little bit of more formal training on this lens on innovation that I bring, and I'll do that from a very practical perspective because I'll be presenting quantitative data from a national survey of businesses in the United States that perform ecological restoration. And the upshot of this is I'll spend about the last third of my talk uh, pondering some of the complications that have emerged from this empirical work that uh, I've done. And the hope is, is that once um, you go, once you leave this talk and you go through the conference, that as you go to the sessions, and I was so 
um, excited about participating in so many of the sessions that are talking about innovations in ecological restoration that you'll have a lens to interpret some of the challenges and opportunities in the deployment and scaling up of those innovations to um, really make a difference in the uh, ecological restoration and habitat restoration. All right, so let's get started. First of all, um, when we talk about innovation, innovation has many definitions. In fact, I just submitted last week uh, a book chapter on perspectives on innovation. But the most common definition is a very simple one, and it's essentially any new idea, device, or method that allows people to apply better solutions to solve existing problems. And what we see in the business of restoration, which is big business, by the way, there's you know, millions and billions of dollars spent on the restoration economy. There are both inhibiting factors to deploying these new approaches, and of course there are also on the flip side facilitating factors. And we do know that we need innovation in this context because we need larger scale solutions to overcome the environmental degradation that we've seen. When we look at what's happening in uh, that literature in innovation and restoration, a recent article in Restoration Ecology uses this definition and says innovation and restoration brings novel techniques and new approaches to achieve restoration goals. And this is the idea of applying a new lens. Um, much like all of the literature on innovation, there are some best practices regarding a culture of innovation. And this requires a very entrepreneurial mindset. And when we see that word entrepreneur, many of the restoration businesses uh, that I studied are actually small businesses. They tend to be started by ecological scientists or people who are trained in ecology. They haven't been trained in business. And so this idea of how to manage their business for profitability and maintain ecological integrity is a tension that some of these businesses face. Entrepreneurs by nature tend to not be very risk averse. And at the same time, um, I'll foreshadow this a little bit, uh, many of the businesses we spoke to are rather risk averse and this inhibits their ability to deploy innovations. To bring innovation and an innovation mindset to any field requires challenging dogma and long-held assumptions. So there are two articles, uh, again recently in a special issue in Restoration Ecology, it's a special issue on innovation. So when we say restoration should use native species, there's one article there that really questions this black and white lens on invasives are bad, natives are good, um, that challenges existing dogma. Is local provenance always the best? And even at breakfast this morning, I was having a conversation uh, really challenging, well, it could be with climate change, we need to expand the way we think about provenance in terms of survivability in light of climate change. So this gives just a couple examples of some innovations in restoration. And again, the program is filled with lots of sessions about this new way of thinking and challenging existing dogma. But the minute you say challenge existing dogma, it makes people really uncomfortable. Um, and that's you know one of the exciting things about innovation is how you communicate about that challenge in a way that allows people to lean into it as opposed to say, that is sacrilege. Uh, let's see, so Libby Metcalf and I, one of uh, the members of my interdisciplinary research team, we collected qualitative data that Kingsley heard me present a year ago in Brazil. And this qualitative data, when we talked to businesses in the Upper Clark Fork River, identified the following barriers to innovation. Managing the cost efficiency of projects is critically important, and the minute we talk about trying new and unproven things, we might be doing that to save costs, but oftentimes we don't know what the efficacy of those new things are, and as a result, this worry about cost tends to inhibit innovation. In addition, uh, agencies oftentimes have an RFP, and they say what techniques they want you to use, and as a result, that constrains innovation. There is high uncertainty about using unproven methods or novel techniques. One of our respondents said, we certainly don't want to be a poster child for failure. But the flip side of this is uh, the lens on innovation says that this tolerance for failure is really important to an entrepreneurial or innovative mindset. So we see this tension. 
And then getting back to this idea of many of the business practitioners that we spoke to were rather risk averse. So there are serious barriers to innovation. This led to the research questions that we use to guide our data collection in this year's quantitative study that we rolled out. And first of all, we were just curious for the businesses we studied, what are their perceptions about the level of innovation in the field of restoration generally? And what innovations are these businesses trying? What do they think they're doing that's innovative? And then what are the relationships between that level of innovation and the practitioner characteristics? the characteristics of their company, such as the geographic location or the particular uh, area of habitat restoration that they're involved in, whether it's estuaries or marine landscapes or forests, terrestrial landscapes. And then what are the characteristics of the project that might affect the level of innovation? Uh, if any of you were on the field trip last year in Paraguay, you might remember this as a picture from our field trip last year at SER in Brazil and Paraguay. It was the coolest field trip. Okay, so when we talk about individual behaviors and innovation, there's a very rich body of literature for, I don't know, it goes back to the 1950s that studies what are the characteristics of people who are highly innovative. Uh, this work is done by Everett Rogers, and he identifies both demographics such as age, income, occupation as being predictors of innovativeness, and that's been validated in multiple contexts over multiple years. If you're interested in reading some classic models of innovation, Everett Rogers is kind of the go-to Bible on diffusion of innovation. Uh, he also brings in this notion of what are your values and beliefs. And uh, sometimes innovators are referred to as rogues or mavericks. Oftentimes those words, again, are scary to people. We want to play it safe. We want to be a little bit more conservative. And then we actually measured people's philosophy of restoration, whether they believed that all we needed to do was nudge nature in the right direction and nature could take over versus using more heavy-handed techniques that might be described as over-engineering, but the idea is we certainly don't want nature to undo all the millions of dollars that we've spent to restore something. So there's this tension in that philosophy. Um, Training in a particular protocol is interesting. In the United States, common protocols are the Rosgen method of river channel design, for example, or the fire regime classification. And uh, there are two sides on this. One is that once you use a particular protocol, you stick with that protocol, and it kind of puts these guardrails on what you're willing to do. And as a result, they can lead to a lack of innovation. So we wanted to study what methodology people were trained in and the extent to which they relied on that methodology in their work and how did that correlate with the project level innovation. Innovation also is strongly related to the sources of information that people rely on. So we measured about uh, 10 sources of information and asked people to report how frequently do you go to conferences, how frequently do you attend economic, excuse me, not economic, um, academic presentations. And so I'll get to that in a minute. And then partnerships with research scientists came out as being critically important in the qualitative field work that Libby and I did a year ago. I won't go through all of these, but you can see these are the company characteristics. I'll come back to these when I present the results. And then the project characteristics. And again, I'll come back to these when I present the results. So these were all pulled based on the literature, based on our qualitative study, and I also uh, pre-tested the study design with three practitioners, three academics, Bethany Walder, who's the executive director at the United States of the SER, um, and then my interdisciplinary research team all piloted the survey as well. The first question that we had to address was, how are we going to even measure this thing called innovation? And I decided I would go back to the way we look at this from a business perspective, which is that innovation is in the eye of the beholder. So if I perceive something as new, it affects the way I behave. If something is new to me, I have to evaluate it in terms of will I know how to use it? How much risk am I willing to undertake in order to try this new thing? And so it's fairly common in the business literature to ask the user's perception of to what extent are you doing something that is new to you because that affects your behavior and your choices. 
Um, as I mentioned, um, I did pretests with this, and based on this, we crafted seven scale items that I'll come to in a minute regarding perceptions, does this field of ecological restoration need innovation? And what is the actual level of innovation that you're using in your own projects? So the way perceptions are measured is through something that is called a Likert scale. And these have been psychometrically evaluated over years and years by behavioral scientists for their um, properties of reliability and validity. And essentially, on a strongly agree, strongly disagree scale, we used a five-point scale that had a, mid, a midpoint. And then we also allowed people to opt out so that we didn't force them into making choices. We asked them the following four questions about their perceptions of whether the field needs innovation. So strongly agree, strongly disagree. This field is hungry for innovation. In general, I would say the field relies on dated protocols, meaning inferring it needs innovation. Um, there's little agreement on best practices. This was, uh, I'm going to come back to this, the scale did not hang together very well from this uh, psychometric assessment of reliability and validity. And I can see that that was maybe a little bit different, but it did come out in our qualitative research. When there's little agreement on best practices, I can kind of do whatever I want. And as a result, that means that I try lots of new things. So that was the logic that we used when we put that item in there. And that related to, I like to try new things during restoration. On the flip side, for the project-based innovation, we asked three questions. My company used new techniques for this project, and everybody had to define a project that they were working on or had completed in the last year. They had to give us a little nickname for the project so we could code all their answers based on that. And we asked a whole bunch of questions about that specific project. For this project, my company used new techniques. My company introduced unproven methods. And the objectives were very innovative. And for people who scored four or five on that, meaning they strongly agreed with that, we asked them to give us a qualitative description of what is the innovation you were using in your project. So we could go back and get some external assessment of how innovative those things were, according to experts in the field of ecological restoration. So you can see right away that this is a complicated phenomenon to study, to even ask the question, how are we going to measure innovation? Coefficient alpha refers to the extent to which this item, these items hang together, and they measure what they, they purport to measure. The rule of thumb in social science research is that a coefficient alpha should be 0.7 or higher. Um, this is according to theories of reliability. And oftentimes, uh, we see measures like you see here that have a low coefficient alpha. And what you'll see is my results on this measure are not very strong. And we don't know if that's because it's actually not correlated or because the measure has low reliability. So that is a big caveat in interpreting the results for this first uh, dependent measure that I have. The overall variance in these innovation scales captured only 41% of the variance, uh, according to a factor analysis, which says there's lots more going on in innovation that this early preliminary study hasn't tapped into. And so I'll be really curious to get feedback from all of you. What am I missing here that we could enrich this study by asking more uh, kind of ideas about innovation? A second complicating factor was how to actually develop an email list to distribute the survey to for a nationwide study. Uh, Bethany gave us the membership database for the Society of Ecological Restoration. And we did not include NGOs and uh, so dot orgs and dot edus because we were really interested in this cost benefit from a business lens on innovation because the businesses are the ones that incur the cost of those and then if they don't work out it affects their profitability. We also mailed to the Ecological Restoration Journal mailing list. This is published by the University of Wisconsin Press. You'll see the response rate there was not very high. And we also mailed to the Environmental Business Journal the um, response rate there was a little bit higher. Today, I'm only presenting the results from the Society of Ecological Restoration membership base, um, primarily because I'm worried about non-response bias for the other two studies, and I need to do a little bit more work on those two study non-response bias. My two graduate students just bring a smile to my face. Jess Deal and Tina Cummins both received a Master of Science in Business Analytics, and they are rock stars when it comes to quantitative analysis, survey coding. Um, survey data collection, and it, they've just been a delight to work with. 
All right, so this tells you who responded to the survey. What you'll see here is in the national sample of U.S. businesses, we had 30% were female, 67% were male, 3% chose to either not identify as either or did not answer. Um, and our database, uh, our set of respondents, if you look here, they had categories of ages they could choose. So it looks like about 50 is the median. And you'll see that we had um, just kind of an, I, I guess I'll just say an average age of 50, with the women definitely skewing to a younger age. On average, our uh, set of respondents had 20 years of experience. Uh, the median was just a little bit lower than that. The dashed bar is the median. The solid bar is the mean. They had worked about 10 of those years with their current employer, so quite a bit of longevity. But again, the median skewed a little bit lower. Companies tended to be a little bit smaller. On average, they had 25 employees, but the median number of employees was smaller yet, about, I don't know, 12 or 13. Um, and the percent of that business's portfolio that was actually done in restoration work, the mean was about 58%. So they did have other sources of revenue for their business. Uh, we had a very representative national sample. These are broken out in the United States by Forest Service region. The uh, blue dots are the SER members. Uh, Bethany's mailing list included some non-members, so we wanted to code for those differently to see if there was a difference between members and non-members in terms of their use of innovation. And then the size of the dot reflects the size of the company. So we've got kind of a cluster there on the eastern seaboard. On average, our respondents completed 13 projects a year. However, the median was quite a bit lower with most companies working on about four. That reflects the smaller size of the companies in our sample. And their mean project size in US dollars was 100,000, but again, the median skewed quite a bit lower. We did have some outliers here. We had one company that had done 200 projects. We had one company that had a project size of 2 million, and we did, according to normal statistical procedures, remove outliers so that we didn't have to deal with some of the skew in the data. Okay, so now to the results. In terms of perceptions that the field needs innovation, what you'll see is the mean on this score was about a 3.5. I think it's interesting that in my research, everybody talks about innovation. Uh, from my experience attending a few conferences, and I've just made a broad sweeping statement, but nobody actually scored five. Like those bars don't stack up saying more and more and more. So the field needs innovation, but we don't need it to the strongest level possible, suggesting that we're already doing okay here, perhaps. But in terms of the actual level of innovation on the project, you'll see the mean on that is slightly lower, with most companies scoring about a 3.03. .03. And the correlation between these two measures was 0.36. So perhaps not as high as I would have expected, um, so interesting in terms of the level of innovation. In terms of the companies who scored four or five on project level innovation, what innovations did they perceive as being innovative that they were using? I wanted to go over these with you because I did have Kara Nelson and another ecologist score these for me. And um, what the companies perceived as being innovative, um, Experts might not say that's as innovative as the company thought. And I'm going to come back to that later, because innovation is in the eye of the beholder. That affects their behaviors. So one company was using pre-vegetated mats on trenching and permafrost sites. Um, several companies were using techniques and procedures from other regions or contexts in a new region or context. And modifying that for a new region or context was considered innovative. And I give an example here of wetland functional analysis where it hadn't been used before. Uh, I saw a session on the program here for drone mounted sensors, which is uh, increasing in its use in ecological restoration as drones are across multiple disciplines. One study introduced native plantings in the urban environment in order to enhance the ability of wildlife to survive in the urban environment, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, these plantings were cultivated through a large interdisciplinary team of botanists and ecologists, and the new techniques involved this cultivation of plants that could survive the urban environment in order to maximize the diversity of wildlife in these contrived habitat areas. I, I think this is quite interesting. And then a secondary objective was to provide a pleasing landscape aesthetic that would be easy to maintain. Um, again, just showing you a sense of what our respondents considered to be innovative. Um, 
using some of these woody debris at the edge of a wetlands to provide habitat for invertebrates and vertebrates. And then I wasn't sure on the difference between roller chopping and root raking, but the roller chopping appeared to work, and then it didn't work over a longer term, and so they've gone back to the traditional uh, technique of root raking. So what do we know about how the individual's characteristics are correlated with innovation? Remember, I have those two scales. Field needs innovation, my perception that the field needs this. We have to kind of look at those with a little bit of caution because of the low coefficient alpha. But there were lots of variables that were significantly correlated with the use of project innovation. With respect to age, uh, it's kind of interesting that generally innovators, according to Everett Rogers, tend to be younger. But in this data set, uh, the more uh, the older ecologists tended to report higher levels of project-based innovation. Perhaps with age comes confidence. Um, so I thought that was an interesting correlation. We see a significant difference in gender with women reporting slightly lower levels of project innovation compared to the male respondents. And there is a correlation between gender and age, so that might be reflected here as well, that we might need to partial that out. What's interesting is the level of experience was not significantly related to the uh, project innovation. So I think there's something going on among these three variables that we need to tease out. Risk aversion was measured with a three-point scale, and it had a very strong coefficient alpha, and we see a strong negative correlation. This is consistent with all the research I've ever read on innovation. And across the different fields of ecological restoration, I'll read what's on the bottom here, because um, I don't think that you can see it in the back. On the low end of project innovation, we have water quality. The next box is ecological sciences. The next box is plants and botany, then wildlife biology, then construction, the big yellow movers and their level of innovation, forestry and conservation, and then the uh, highest score, and I put that in air quotes because, again, the highest score is only around the scale midpoint, so it's not a huge level of innovation was in the environmental sciences. Now, people could pick more than one area of expertise, so we have some confounding here in the measures, but there is a significant difference between the low end of 2.69 and the high end of 3.14, which is interesting to me because you would think that's not a big difference, but when you can tease out a statistically significant difference due to the variance in that, I think it's you know worth looking at. And I'll come back to this again. I'm just throwing out the data to you right now. I mentioned we measured how frequently do people use a wide variety of sources of information. NS means not significant. So the only source of information that was significantly related to project innovation was the extent to which a respondent said they rely a lot on uh, industry-specific resources. So let's define what those are. We defined it as online blogs, online webinars, and in-person trainings by private companies, such as the Wetlands Institute in the United States. And what we see here is, contrary to standard innovation research, these sources of information are actually negatively correlated with project innovation. So right away, I start thinking, OK, what content is in those industry sources of information that perhaps reinforces existing protocols rather than expanding the horizon of the people who are looking at that? Or do people self-select into the sources of information that they use, and maybe the less innovative people generally are using those sources compared to reading academic journals, reading practitioner journals, going to conferences, attending presentations at universities? So that's something that I think was quite interesting. Um, another interesting finding here is that when our practitioners reported that they engaged with research scientists in their projects, that was positively correlated with innovation. So again, I start thinking, okay, what are the attributes of somebody who actually is more likely to engage with those research scientists, and how do we cultivate those attributes in order to get that engagement to get more innovation? So in summary here, we have some variables at the individual level that are positively correlated and some that are negatively correlated, but we have a whole bunch that are not significantly related. And I'm going to come back to the non-significant findings because as uh, 
academics and researchers, you know, a non-significant finding, there's multiple explanations for is it really non-significant or is it something in your method that you need to tease out a little bit further. Interesting, the philosophy of restoration was unrelated to innovation, so whether they believed in nudging nature along or using these more heavy-handed techniques. Okay, so now I'll briefly present the company and project-specific factors out of this big, long list. Uh, you'll see that a large number of them were actually non-significant. So when companies had projects that included social goals, such as public use and recreation, that was positively correlated with project innovation. I think that's an interesting result. What leads projects to be more likely to include social goals as part of them, in addition to the ecological goals? Project complexity, positively associated with innovation, this is interesting because typically more complex things, we tend to try to put boundaries or parameters on that. That sometimes leads to a lack of innovation if it's very complex, but I can see the logic for enhancing innovation as well. And longer projects, maybe it gives people a little more lead time to really try new things. When a company reported that they had uncertainty in the project because they lacked experience with the particular um, project parameters, they perceived that they were using more innovative uh, techniques in their project. We also measured two other sources of uncertainty. Uncertainty related to politics on the job. Uh, the projects we've studied, you have to juggle competing stakeholders. Oftentimes those divergent perspectives introduce a lot of uncertainty. Project politics were unrelated to innovation in our study. And the other source of uncertainty is introduced due to climate change. What are we going to do to manage our habitat restoration in this uncertain future that we face? Uh, that was positively correlated to the field needs innovation, but it was not related to the specific project level innovation. So out of the three sources of uncertainty, one was positive related. And uh, again, Karen and I had a long talk about, is this because they lack experience and therefore they think they're innovative when in fact they're really not that innovative because other companies are already doing this? And again, I get back to innovation is in the eye of the beholder because that affects their behaviors. Now, for the companies in our study who had completed the project, and about 40 of them had actually completed the work, we tried to look at what was the impact of project innovation on outcomes. Did they complete the project on time? Did innovation slow them down? Was it on budget? Did that innovation lead to cost overruns? Did they accomplish their design objectives? And did they meet major milestones? None of those were significantly related to project innovation. Again, small sample, only 40 projects had been completed. But the practitioners reported very high personal satisfaction with the project when they used innovations in it. They felt really good about that work. So um, when we look at the summary of findings here, this is for that first scale, my perceptions that the field needs innovation. Only four variables were related to that. So there's a lot going on, whether that's a measurement issue or whether that's um, the context, I'm not sure. But what I thought I would do now in the last section of my talk uh, I guess I'll tell you that we have beat this data set with lots of techniques. And um, I think presenting the simple correlation gives us some opportunities to look at things. But I don't think with the measures that we have for innovation that we're really able to use more rigorous statistics right now. So that's going to be the next study that we do to kind of tease out some of these findings to do a survey that's a little more focused. We see project-based innovations. I think you've gathered this from the talk already, so I want to get into this pondering idea. I was personally surprised by the factors that I thought would be negatively correlated with innovation that were non-significant. In the business literature, large companies are perceived to be inertia, filled with inertia. They have bureaucracy. They tend to find it harder to innovate, to be nimble. Small companies tend to be more nimble. Company size was not related. People in the United States complain bitterly about the regulatory environment and how it constrains what they can do. And in this case, it was not significantly related. Um, objectives, did they allow you to do your best work? Not related. And the factors I thought would be positively correlated were also non-significant, such as attending conferences like this or collaborating with other businesses to get synergies. 
And so this takes me back to how do we really measure innovation in this context? We felt good about our two scales at the outset, but our adaptations from other fields or regions, are those really innovative? And Kara said, just because something's unproven doesn't mean that it's necessarily innovative. And if we have a new method, is that new to the company or is it really innovative? And we asked people across wide regions with wide expertise, and perhaps there's just a lot of noise in this data set. Maybe we need to focus on terrestrial uh, mine reclamation and we'd see something really specific in a specific context. So as I move forward in my literature, we look at two categories of innovation. Minor modifications of existing techniques versus truly radical breakthroughs. So maybe genomics and restoration would be radical because that's going to totally change the lens and the method. But modifications of techniques in a new context, that's incremental. And what we see in my literature is there are different results based on this typology of innovation. Maybe we need to have our innovations rated by experts rather than self-reports. Maybe that would lead to different results. And how do these practitioners who are risk-averse, risk what do they think is innovation? Um, we study in business what is your likelihood of adopting this new thing, and so we could do different methods to actually tease some of these out. I'm thinking of putting together some scenarios, and maybe we could even do something in the field with two different projects, one that is highly innovative, one that uses business as usual, and comparing the results. Um, there are lots of questions to be asked with respect to understanding the facilitators and barriers to innovation in this context. And I'm interested in the last one because this push towards national standards and certification gets us all on the same page about what best practices might be. But also literature shows that if those standards don't change over time, they can actually become these straitjackets that inhibit innovation in the future. So that's an interesting conundrum to look at. So I'm looking at some different models right now. Um, can we use, uh, are there different relationships between these predictors, the company characteristics, the individual characteristics, and the outcomes? And does that relationship depend on whether there are innovations being used or not and the level of those innovations? If we look at the type of innovation and its impact on project outcomes, do those vary depending on whether we're talking about a marine restoration, a forest rest restoration, um, a mining reclamation? Does the ecosystem actually have an impact on the results that we're seeing here? So there are lots of ways methodologically to tease out what's going on. And that's where I plan on going with some of my data analysis. I'd be really interested to get your feedback on this, questions that I've missed, get your perceptions because I am new to this field. I've only been doing this for five years, and I feel like I'm bringing this fresh perspective, but also I don't have that insider's knowledge that sometimes is so useful. This is my beautiful home in Missoula, Montana, that we do miss a lot. We'll be going back on December 1st. Um, I have a sabbatical in New Zealand right now, so it's really been my honor to be invited to be here, and uh, hopefully this will be fodder for discussion as we go through this conference together. Thank you. Um, thank you. Mike, check, check, check. Yeah, it, it is on. Um, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, we've run out of time for questions, but Jackie, before you leave, I, I think one of the key questions is um, where do you find the innovation engine room? Where is that? And uh, I, I have a belief it's within all of us, but maybe you have a comment on that. Um, the innovation engine room, really, I, I call that what are the sources of innovation. And uh, there are many sources of innovation. And one of the sources that we are actually using business right now is looking to nature as a source of innovation. And so I think collectively, our heads in conversation, the synergies are really important. There's a really nice book called Emergence by Steve Johnson that the innovations really happen at the interstitials of disciplines who are coming together. And so how do we look at what's happening in other disciplines like genomics, for example, or other technologies, and how can we attend those conferences to get insights that we bring back to ecological restoration? So I really look at... Um, yes, it's important to talk together, but it's really important to get outside of our own lens and to look 
with fresh eyes at things happening in other areas and bring them into our area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Jackie. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Our next speaker needs uh, very little introduction. Um, Professor David Lindemeyer from the Finnis School of Environmental and S of Environment and Society. Um, David's, uh, of course, been a champion of environmental causes. Um, he's currently operating six large-scale projects and looks at the intersection between agriculture and natural landscapes, in fact, production landscapes. And look, I won't steal his thunder, but to hand over to David to present on restoration insights and challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to, to, to speak today. Um, this, this talk's got several themes. The, the first one is just very briefly to skate across the extent of degraded land globally and, and, and at other scales and some of the impacts, probably no news to anybody here. Um, and then some new insights into some of our long-term restoration work in, in farming landscapes. And those new insights very much are in, underpinned by long-term data sets to inform what we're seeing. And then some of the challenges that I think are really important for restoration and, and how are we going to deal with two billion hectares of degraded land globally at least. And then some, some other truly multidisciplinary perspectives on restoration that are, that are coming to the fore that I also think are really important in the context of, for example, the drought that we're current, currently experiencing in, in uh, parts of Australia. So this kind of map would be familiar with most people. It's, it's really quite extraordinary to think about just how much of the world's land surface is, is degraded. Um, it varies from 27% to more than 60% of, of the planet's land. It's, it's really quite staggering. And uh, this is a bit of a summary from a paper not, not so long ago, in 2015, from uh, Gibbs and Salmon. And they, they outline the different perspectives that different people have depending on their definitions in terms of, of what's going on on the planet. And the impacts on the land are really quite extraordinary when you start to sum up the numbers. You know, more than 2 billion hectares of degraded land, an area the size of Russia, direct impacts on over 3 billion people. We're still undergoing land clearing, including in the state that we're in right at the moment, where land clearing rates are apparently pretty close to what we see in Brazil. And there are other really major drivers that are going on here. Um, for me, it was quite staggering to discover more recently that 60% of the world's mammal biomass is livestock. And that industry is increasing in terms of its herd size at about 2.6% per annum, which is really quite staggering. 36% of the remaining mammal biomass on the planet is, is us, according to, to a paper in um, PNAS. And the impacts, for example, in Australia in terms of its effects on, on uh, saline lands and soil degradation are just truly colossal. So that's, to me, why groups such as yourselves are so critical to how the planet's going to look in 10, 20, 30, 50 years' time. So let's change gears a little bit to some of the insights into restoration that we've been gathering from uh, engaging in this process for the last 20 odd years. So I have this sort of uh, almost schizophrenic brain that, that sort of cycles between forests on one side and restoration in agricultural lands on the other and, the, and there are some very important uh, interfaces of the two um, that exercise my mind. So these insights have come from lots of partnerships with lots of grassroots groups as well as major funding bodies and this is such a truly colossal process to keep the long-term funding going to, to understand these insights. But long-term is really essential when you have often very slow-moving systems where things change, don't change very rapidly. You need to look at them for a long time to see what's going on. So the first problem is to deal with what's called Brandolini's Law, uh, or the bullshit asymmetry principle. And it's very, very important in the context of what I've had to deal with since 1996. You know, the, and um, essentially, perhaps we'll go to the next slide 
to illustrate Brandolini's law, and there's a picture of yours truly there. I'm standing in front of you disguised as a much older man now. But the person in the middle was then, in 1996, the newly elected Environment Minister, Robert Hill. And Robert Hill and his minders, some of whom have now become very famous in the environment area, told me unequivocally that we already knew everything we needed to know about restoration and scientists needed to just get out of the effing way so that people could rush out and plant trees. And therein lies how much work it's taken to refute Brandolini's law. Uh, and some of these insights actually only come from the fact that we actually didn't know a lot about what makes effective restoration and that journey of learning is still going on, which makes this such an exciting field. So passing beyond that, interestingly, by the time a large part of Australia's telephone company had been sold and we had entered into the realm of what was called Natural Heritage Trust in those days and the scientists had been removed from the process and the tree planting had begun, senior officials in uh, a previous of many iterations of the department environment came to us and said, can you please do some monitoring so we can work out what the hell is actually going on on the ground? And so therein started uh, a series of several very large scale projects, some of which are still going on today, looking at what's going on in terms of what's happening with restoration, is it working, what's working, what isn't, and, and why, and what are some of the, some of the changes. And this is very much on the ground, empirical measurements, particularly of what biodiversity is doing, but also in terms of what the vegetation itself is doing. So I'm going to give you two or three little uh, insights into what we've seen over time. So we have looked at many different responses as part of looking at, at, at uh, these ecosystems. So replanted areas, deliberately replanted areas, remnant vegetation, but also natural regeneration. And that's important because we've discovered that natural regeneration and replanted areas are actually quite different habitats and they have different kinds of species assemblages and behave in quite different ways. And it's not clear to us still, after 20 years, whether or not replanted areas and regrowth vegetation are actually on the same trajectory or not, which is quite an interesting insight. But we've looked at a whole series of different groups, arboreal marsupials, birds, reptiles, and we understand that birds are really good indicators of birds. <laughs> and they tell you very little about reptiles and in fact very little about arboreal marsupials. And that's not to discount the importance of birds. I love birds and I do lots of bird counts myself. But um, you need to know more about systems through looking at a range of different groups. So let's go beyond that and think about some of these other perspectives of what we're looking at, at uh, individual uh, natural assets, be they rocky outcrops, paddock trees, through to large-scale effects at the landscape level and then an intermediate scale at a farm level. And these scales, as we'll see later, are actually quite intimately uh, connected to one another. So at various stages, people have gone through in the Department of Environment and uh, other agencies, we're going to have a single species focus and then we back away from that and then we have a landscape focus and then we go backwards and forwards between the two. And in fact, there's an enormous synergy between these different uh, species-specific and landscape-specific approaches, which tells you more about the whole, as we'll see that in a moment. So one of the key things that's often asked in this space is, we've done a lot of work, we've changed the amount of vegetation in the landscape. Is is there a change versus change perspective? So are we seeing changes in biodiversity as, as a consequence of the changes of the efforts that go in on the ground? And the answer is yes. So the landscapes that we have been working in over the last two decades have seen quite dramatic changes in, in vegetation cover. 3.4% of added vegetation cover in the southwest slopes bioregion of southern New South Wales. So this is the most heavily altered bioregion in that state and it's not unlike what we see in other parts of, of the world such as in Victoria and, and uh, further north from there. So extensive changes but also 
extraordinary efforts from people on the ground to, to foster natural regeneration, but also to do direct planting on the ground. And 3.4% of vegetation cover in a decade is actually an enormous change in uh, previously heavily modified environments. And we can see that from satellites and that pattern, trend pattern beyond 2010 is continuing, although I have to say that there are some places where there has been an increase in vegetation clearing in southern New South Wales. We can come back and talk about that later. So how do we study this? Essentially, we've got what's called a nested hierarchical design. So we have sites within farms, farms within landscapes. Those landscapes vary in terms of how much native vegetation cover there has been. The farms vary in terms of how much effort has gone in to replant vegetation along streamlines and on hilltops. And then we uh, repeatedly survey those sites for various elements of the biota. And we're going to talk mostly about birds uh, in the next minute or so. So what has actually been changing? What we've seen is that there is quite a strong link between increasing amount of vegetation and changes in vegetation cover and its relationships to the number of bird species. And people say, well, OK, that's the relationship that you see for overall bird species. What about the birds of conservation concern? Those birds of conservation concerns show the same pattern of response is called the curve of diminishing returns. And what that curve basically shows is that if one of your objectives is to increase bird species richness, actually the lower part of the curve is where you see the, the, the biggest return on investment for, for, um, for work in terms of doing your efforts on the ground. So the positive side to this is that you can make a difference even in landscapes that have had a fair degree of modification in the past. There are other aspects to this in much more detail, but let's surf across those and look at some other things. And that, that essentially is that vegetation cover crudely has a high degree of explanatory power in telling you what, what is going on with, with uh, the bird biota in this system. You can break it down and look at individual bird species. For example, there are very strong positive effects on the brown tree creeper as a bird of conservation concern as you start to drive up the amount of vegetation cover in the landscape irrespective of whether it's natural regeneration or replantings. And there are very strong negative effects, which in, in this case are good, in terms of driving down species like the common starling, which we don't want to have in these kinds of environments. Importantly, we see these kinds of patterns at each scale in the hierarchy. So we see it at a site level, we see it at a farm level, and we see it at a landscape level. And there's an interaction between those three scales. So what that broadly tells us is that when you do work at a site level or a farm level, you can see a positive impact at a landscape level. Now, we need to watch out for the parasite effect, and that is that when farmer Wendy does very good work on her farm, farmer Bill that does very little on his farm will actually benefit from what happens next door. And, and so we have to work with people on the ground to make sure that they're actually pulling their weight in this space as well. OK, so many people want to know what happens when we start to graze these replanted areas. As many of these, these uh, restoration blocks have now been in place for 20 or 30 years, what happens when we put these um, large animals into these restored areas? And what we actually start to see is that when the fences start to degrade or they're actually physically removed, and then stock starts grazing in these replanted areas, many of the positive benefits of restoration start to be eroded and eroded quite quickly. So, for example, grazing alters the leaf litter layer of, of these environments, and there are strong relationships between leaf litter layers and uh, birds, but also particularly strong effects for reptiles. So we can look at this in, in a quantitative sense using methods like path analysis, and you get these curves and, and uh, patterns like this. And this, what's this essentially doing is looking for the pathways that connect relationships, for example, in this case, between uncontrolled grazing at the bottom there and the amount of leaf litter. You can see a negative effect there, but we can see that there's a positive relationship between the amount of leaf litter and bird species richness. We can also see, for example, that there's a positive relationship between the width of the planting and bird species richness, independent of some of these other covariates which uh, characterise these planted areas. 
And we can see similar kinds of things going on for reptile species richness as well. So essentially the, the message here is that once we start to put these large herbivores, exotic herbivores, back into these restored areas, some of their positive benefits in terms of biodiversity responses start to be eroded. So there's some very practical things to think about in terms of how you deal with, with some of these restored areas in these parts of the landscape. Okay, some work which isn't published at this stage is to be look, looking at what's going on with climate. So that's long-term climate patterns and short-term weather patterns plantings and farm resilience. And again, this is in a biodiversity context. And for us, we're now going into our second major drought period across this area. And we can start to see what goes on in these systems, not through one drought, but now deep into a second drought. And what are the biodiversity responses that we're seeing? Well, the first one is that plantings turn out to be critical refuges for bird biodiversity and also reptile biodiversity in these systems. So the small bird species are, res are responding to these often quite dense environments, the landscape texture hypothesis. We see that migratory birds are seeking out some of these plantings particularly, and those effects as drought refuges are seen during droughts, but not during the, the wetter inter-drought periods. So we actually start to need to think about some of these these uh, woodland environments as being mostly and primarily in drought with the shorter periods of, of wetter weather in between. We have to rethink what we're, we're doing in these systems. And I think that's really important to start to, to communicate the message that, for example, a thousand millimetres of rain in 2020 is not the same as a thousand millimetres of rain in 1950. And, and that message still has not resonated with, with many people in the agricultural sector as yet. Okay, so one of the true weapons of mass destruction in Australia's temperate woodland environments is the noisy miner. And there are you know, some outstanding researchers that have worked on this. Carla's work in the audience is, is really a bench setter for us. We have looked at the noisy miner in quite some detail. It's a, it's a, a hyper-aggressive native honey eater and it's listed as a key threatening process in woodlands because it has enormous effects on smaller bodied birds. And our long term data sets actually show that noisy miners by and large don't occupy plantings when they have an understory of wattles and other dense vegetation. What has also been really interesting in this case, again only resolved from long term research, is that when you do interventions by enhancing plantings with understory vegetation, that drives down noisy miners quite significantly. And so you need to be able to produce a little bit of data to show this. Um, on the left, uh, percentage under, uh, uh, cover of acacia in the understory shows the probability of occurrence of the noisy miner in relation to that attribute of the planting. And on the right-hand side, the years since enhancement, and we can see gradually over time the number of noisy miners being driven down as those en enhancements come up underneath an area of woodland where there's been um, vegetation planted. So there's some other work that um, won't resonate with the National Rifle Association in the USA, but essentially our approach to thinking about tackling the problem with despots like the noisy miner is not to use guns, but to use trees. So Richard Beggs has been doing some really interesting work looking at what happens when we remove the noisy miner using lead therapy and then seeing what happens to these ecosystems once the noisy miner's been removed, do the small birds respond? And the answer to the question was actually it only takes a few weeks to a few months before populations of noisy miners have completely recolonised those cleared woodland patches and not only that, the new ones that come back come back with inventions and are much more grumpy than the ones that were there previously. So essentially then that tells us that what we need to do is start to think of this more in a, in a context of how can we use other methods other than lead therapy to solve the problem with the noisy miner. And that's where this intersection of, of ecological systems and understanding vegetation and animals' response behaviourally to these kinds of things to solve that problem. Okay, so some of these insights 
have really um, only come from robust monitoring. And to me, robust monitoring actually needs to be part of any restoration program. So you can actually tell what's, what's really happening in, in these systems. That monitoring needs to be rigorously designed. So for example, we know that um, about a third of Australia's threatened species are not monitored at all. We also know that the re another third of the monitoring that is done is, is really not terribly uh, effective because you can't really tell what's going on. So I believe that any major programs that, that invest in this area of restoration actually need to have part of their budgets assigned to monitoring so that you can really tell what's going on. And that monitoring needs to be long term. We did not see the, the outcomes to uh, our enhancement program. You can see that we're going out there to nearly 15 years before we really start to see the effects kick in quite strongly for the reduction in noisy miners. So the inputs also need to be monitored quite carefully. So how much did you spend? How much effort did you put into this? And you need some sensible ways to calculate that because many landowners are very dedicated to this cause and they will often dramatically underestimate how much effort they've put in and undervalue the, the, the inputs that they've put into their work. But we need that input information to be able to look at return on investment. What's the most cost effective way of doing things relative to the most ecologically effective way of doing things? And I think that we need to learn the lessons, for example, from the Natural Heritage Trust and Caring for Our Country and a whole scat of others, where the reviews have essentially said that we can't tell what's really going on because we didn't monitor them properly. We actually need to reverse Brandolini's law and actually couple together program delivery with, with good science and monitoring to really know where we're going with this. And that, that really is not the direction that's presently being taken with many policies in many areas. And we need to tackle that and drive that back to where it's supposed to be. Okay, so some of the challenges I think that are really important in this restoration space is that really, you know, as we, we saw from Brandolini's, before, Brandolini's law before, business and politicians don't take restoration seriously. So I'll give you a, a brief example, and I won't ma name names, but we were recently dealing with a large pastoral company. It's based on pension funds in the USA. They claimed to be worth $350 million in terms of their uh, investment in Australian agriculture. When it came to investing in restoration and monitoring, $25,000 was just too far for them to go. I kid you not. Uh, I rest their case. If they really think that they're going to buy in social goals, social impact, then their approach is based, they're basically victims of immaculate self-deception if they think that that's going to take them where they have to get to. They need to have serious investments in this space. So business and politicians also don't take monitoring seriously and they don't understand the relationships between the, the, those two and how closely they need it to be knitted together. The other thing I think is really uh, important in this space is that essentially we are not valuing the natural assets in agricultural areas and in forests in the right way. And there are ways of getting at that, which we'll talk about in a moment. And there are other really important values, including mental health values, which I'll talk about in a moment, that are also overlooked in this space. So we need to think carefully about how we can better couple together restoration, livestock production, agriculture, financial improvements, mental health. There are, there are really serious challenges here amongst researchers and managers and, and policy makers to look at these interlinkages if we're going to be able to achieve even a partial pathway towards the restoration goals that we're trying to, to, to drive towards. So we're trying to do a bit of this through a new project at the ANU, the Sustainable Farms Project, that looks at the mental health of farmers the financial health of farms and also the ecological and environmental health of farms. And this is without doubt the most challenging project I have ever worked on because people in those different disciplines think quite differently, they speak very different languages, have entirely different reward systems and um, I'm hoping that we can meet that challenge, let's put it that way. So the Sustainable Farms Project is supported by uh, a range of foundations it's deliberately gone outside of most government funding. And the idea is to quantify, continue to quantify biodiversity responses 
to changes on farms since 1998, to think about new ways of valuing the natural assets on farms. Now, this is really important. For example, how do we restore farm dams in ways that keep water on land for longer and give you better water quality, which we know improves livestock health and biodiversity on farms quite strongly? We need to understand the benefits of restoration in that case, which is what we're trying to do in that farm dam space. But we also have started to see, anecdotally, that farmers that engage in restoration end up being in a better mental health state. So anecdotally, that's, that information is very strong. Um, it's a very sensitive issue to start to dig into uh, where you're at in terms of suicide black spots, uh, all of those kinds of things. So that's taking us into some new areas that are very challenging to work in. But there's clear evidence that there are some strong links between restoration efforts on farms and, and where farmers' mental health is at. So this is truly looking at across the economic side of things, the ecological side of things and the social side of things. And working at that multidisciplinary interface is, is far, far challenging than uh, you would um, normally think it is by the way most people talk about multidisciplinary stuff. So one of the ways that we've been working actually takes takes itself from the right hemisphere in forests. So the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, the OECD and the IMF have actually developed this thing called SEA, the System of Environmental and Economic Accounting, to start to look at the values of natural assets. Now this is exactly the same framework that's used by the national economic accounts to tell us what GDP is every month or every three months. So this is now being applied in a natural asset sense. And we've done this in the central highlands of Victoria where we've worked for over 35 years. And what we've done is assemble data on carbon, water, timber, tourism, biodiversity, agriculture in these areas to start to look at what's called the value added value of natural assets. So these are the values that these natural assets contribute to regional and state GDP on a yearly basis. Now this information comes from annual reports, comes from satellite tourism accounts, it comes from the ABS and other sources of information. And essentially what you're doing is putting it into an accounting ledger. 